Thank you, thank you, thank you so, so much. It's been such a wonderful evening, and we're going to do an additional, what we call, bonus material <laughs> for the uh, people who make contributions to PBS and purchase the DVD. And I'd like to start it out um, with uh, <coughs> having Cecilia once again come out and sing one of the most beautiful renditions of The Rose you'll ever hear. Ladies and gentlemen, Cecilia. goodness sakes, all those tears in the audience. <laughs> it's the sunlight that becomes the rose. I mean, it's that whole thing that the Tao teaches us, isn't it? That 
out of the invisibleness, out of the nothingness, out of the space that uh, has no name. It's the space that's uh, doing nothing, but leaving nothing undone. The Tao does nothing and leaves nothing undone. And you, you are from the Tao. I'd like to just, for a few moments, speak about one more thought. I'd like to see you work at changing. To change the thought from notice me, notice me, to what Lao Tzu, Lao Tzu calls living in obscurity, becoming more obscure. We live in a uh, celebrity-obsessed world, don't we? Look at me. Notice me. The Tao teaches something completely the opposite. Listen to the 66th verse of the Tao. Water again. The sea stays low. And because the sea stays low, all of the rivers and all of the streams empty into it. Because it stays humble. Because it stays in that place of just allowing everything to come to you. He was trying to teach us the important lesson of uh, letting what we know is coming come to us. I practice this so much more now in my life than I did at one time. I can remember years ago, I, was, uh, I had written a book called Your Erroneous Elms back in the 70s. And um, <clears throat> it stayed on the New York Times bestseller list for something like 27 months. And <clears throat> Each, many weeks, it would be number one, and then it would go down to number three, and then it would go to number two, and down to seven, and all of that. And I was doing The Tonight Show in those days, and on a regular basis, and uh, so many of the other shows, the Merv Griffin, and uh, Phil Donahue, and Dinah Shore. I became like a regular on the Dinah Shore. I was like, you know, hobnobbing with Burt Lancaster folks, and uh, you know, just, uh, and um, what you do is you call and f uh, find out where you appear on the, uh, on the bestseller list for the following week on Wednesday. So you call up on Wednesday, not for the Sunday coming up, but for the following week. And I called home, and my ego was pretty strong, and I was very much into a lot of notice me. I, I really believe that true nobility is, is not about being better than anyone else now. It's, it's about being better than you used to be. <laughs> And I think I'm better than I used to be. And just about, I mean, I know that I'm better than I used to be in every quality or every characteristic that I hold to be valuable. Um, but in those days, I was into notice me. And I called home, and I had trained my wife to uh, call the New York Times. She had this special number that she could call and with a certain code, and she could find out where I was going to appear on the bestseller list the following week. So I called her up, and I said, uh, where am I on the bestseller next next week? <laughs> you know, I was out in California doing something, and she said, uh, "You're not on the bestseller list." I said, "What are you talking about? I was number one on the bestseller list last week." I said, "My even my voice changed when I said, <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you mean I'm not on the bestseller list?" She said, "You're not on the bestseller list. I'm sorry." She said, "Your book is on the bestseller list." <laughs> Big distinction there, isn't it, <laughs> between believing that this is me and recognizing that uh, you can let go a little bit of, of, that, of that. Listen to uh, verse 66 of the Tao. Why is the sea king of a hundred streams? Because it lies below them. Humility gives it its power. That's a very important principle to understand. And I live on the ocean, right next to it. It's my front yard. And always I watch it to learn something from this thing called the ocean, which is the most powerful source of life that we have on the planet. Without it, there's no life on this planet. And because it stays low, so what does this have to say to us? Do you have the capacity to get past that ego need to always be saying, notice me, look how important I am. 
I mean, there's been a proliferation of this lately with this celebrity silly stuff, isn't it? I mean, CNN is doing, you know, full hour shows on, uh, on silly little things about what happened to this particular celebrity or what happened to that celebrity, and the celebrity's never even done anything. And it's, uh, there's all of this talk about it, and all of the new magazines. I mean, and you look, you go into, through an airport and you look on the newsstand and all the same photos just with different magazines. I don't even know what, what the names of all of them are, but there's like this huge market now that we have for people to get into a state of notice me, notice me, notice me. And how much do we train our young people, particularly in our schools and so on, that the one who is the star is the one who gets the most attention, the one who is... Uh, the most important and the most valuable is the one that has uh, the most people liking them and so on. This constant obsession with needing to be noticed when in fact what I have found for myself is the, the happiest moments of my life are when I can do it low and slow and not have anybody out there even know what I'm doing. To be able to, I mean, Louise never would have uh, advertised the fact of some of the things I talk about with her generosity. She does it anonymously. It's almost always done in those ways. No, look at me, look and notice me, how important I am, and so on. So much to learn from that kind of wisdom, from that kind of inner connection to the Tao, the ability and the willingness to say, to do it anonymously to say that you can just get done almost anything that you want to get done if you don't become obsessed with taking credit for it. Remember the movie The Magnificent Obsession? Yes. The movie made back, I think, in the 50s. And it was really about what was The Magnificent Obsession? It was the ability to be able to give anonymously. What is Alcoholics Anonymous? It is everybody stays anonymous. Nobody has a title. There's not even anybody in charge. There's nobody, there's no leaders of this. There's no president. There's no vice president. There's no organization. There's no, it's just, here's, here's a group of people who just want to help other people whose lives are out of control. So here's a meeting place. And you come and some, so one day somebody will, uh, will chair it and then somebody else another day will chair it. And one of the things I've found that when I attend one of these meetings um, <clears throat> is that I, I feel... You'll see so many people who are downtrodden, who feel as if their life has passed them by, who look like they don't have any teeth, they haven't shaved, they're, they're dirty, they're um, God in disguise. Mother Teresa was asked the question about what she does when she was in Calcutta, and she said, every day, every day, I see Jesus Christ in all of his distressing disguises all of his distressing disguises, that you can see this source, you can see the Tao, you can see it when, particularly in those who are the most obscure, the most uh, isolated from everyone else. And whenever I go to one of those meetings and I hear people get up and they tell their stories, uh, they, I, I always, I feel that, I feel there's so much presence of the source, of God, of spirit, of Lao Tzu, of the, of the sort of Tao, whatever you want to call it, in one of those meetings than I've ever felt in any church. I've, n I'd, I've never felt the presence of it more. And I encourage you, any of you watching this right now, go to one of those meetings. You don't have to be an alcoholic. You don't have to. And I'm not an alcoholic. I don't call myself an alcoholic. I was never out of control. I drank. But I wasn't out of control, and I, uh, but I still go to those meetings. I have people in my own family that have struggled with addiction, and I go with them, and I sit there, and I listen to those stories, and I, just, I get shivers down my back when I think about how beautiful it is to be in the presence of people. All they want to do is help each other. There's a movie called My Name is Bill W. James Woods plays, and Jim Carn J James Garner is in it, and uh, he... His life just got totally out of control with addictions, totally out of control. And then he went to a, uh, uh, he, he, he went to one of these meetings and he began to realize, and he said, we can, we can actually take these, uh, these people and all we have to do is, all we have to do is love them. All we have to do is, all, and he's so excited about the concept 
of being able to go out there and, and offer it. And I keep referring to Louise because <laughs> she's such a hero to me. Um, there was a time back in the 80s when our president wasn't even able to say the word AIDS, was he? I mean, he could come on. And here was this lady who, before this thing became the worldwide phenomenon that it is, was having meetings in her own house <laughs> and, and, going, and, and bringing these people, these downtrodden people who had been labeled outcasts in society, and offering them a place to learn how to love each other and to care for each other. This was long before there was any celebrity state, status associated with trying to end this horrible crisis that our country has and our world has, has had. There was uh, James Wood so excited about the idea of we can create a place where we're anonymous. Nobody has to know anything about us. We don't have to say our names. We don't have to say anything. We just have to come there and we can help each other. And before that happened, everybody who got out of control with addictions, particularly with alcohol, would, uh, would die. There was no cure. There was no cure. And where did they find their cure? They found it in being anonymous. They found it in being obscure. They found it in having no organization. They found it in having no elected representative. They found it in having no rules. There are no rules. You just come and we care. If you've been one day or one hour sober, or even if you're drunk, you come. We care about you. And you are not that alcohol. Who you are is this divine soul. In the 36th verse of the Tao Te Ching, it says, the gentle outlast the strong. The obscure outlast the obvious. Try to become a little more obscure, a little less interfering, a little less notice me, a little less, you know, one of the specific kinds of things that you can do is just as you're about, when somebody else is talking, just as you're about to interject what you've been thinking about for the whole time, waiting for them to stop talking, <laughs> just as you, to just stop and to bite your tongue and say, tell me more. Or, that's very interesting. I have never heard that point of view before. Even if they totally, completely disagree with everything that you stand for, to be, to be willing to listen, to be able to stop, practice it. I practiced it when I did these verses of the Tao. I practiced it every single day while I was working on that. Just staying obscure. And for me, that's not always so easy because of just being recognized wherever I go. And if I saw someone who was about to recognize me, I would just put my head down. I would just walk a little bit past them like something. Right now, I just want to be anonymous. Right now, I want to be obscure. The Tao says, storms always end. Verse 23, fierce winds don't blow all morning. A downpour of rain doesn't last all day. Who does this? Heaven and earth. You're already connected to everything you want or need. It will come to you at the exact perfect time as the rivers and the streams come to the ocean at the perfect time and place. You gotta trust. You gotta know it's going to come to you. You don't have to chase after it. You can become a little less obsessed with your ego and your self-importance and who you are and what you've done and you can get so much more done and you know what it's the most peaceful and sweet delicious way it's like the song that cecilia was singing about the rose thank you so much and god bless you thank you thank you thank you very much thank you Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hidden within all of the storms of your life is the peace that you desire.
Dr. Wayne Dyer presents a new interpretation of an ancient wisdom text, the Tao Te Ching. Many people call this a manual for achieving a way of life that literally guarantees integrity, joy, peace, and balance in our life. Change your thoughts based upon the wisdom of the Tao and your life will change. Join Dr. Dyer as he reveals how to live the wisdom of the Tao and achieve higher consciousness. When Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life airs next. Thank you so much. It's so, so wonderful to be back on public television. It's now 10 years we've been uh, creating public television uh, programs. Um, it's been a wonderful, wonderful journey. I obviously support public television. It's, uh, it's a way to bring higher consciousness to our entire country, and I'm proud and pleased to be here. This is a program about changing your life not in the traditional way that we think of when we think about changing our lives. Usually that means changing your behaviors, retraining yourself, getting new habits, going out and trying them out and changing your life. This is about changing your thoughts and then your life will change. Change your thoughts, change your life. It's the name of this program, it's the name of the book. It is something that I very, very strongly endorse, that we have within us the ability and the capacity through the way that we use our minds and the way that we process things and events to make our lives totally shift and change around. And I can tell you that it doesn't make any difference what age you are, whether you're a teenager watching this or whether you're someone uh, in your 60s, 70s, 80s or anywhere along the way, you can make that change. And I'll tell you, it happened for me uh, two years ago on the uh, 10th of May, uh, I turned 65. And the next day, uh, on the 11th of May, I <coughs> had a life-changing thing take place for me. I changed the way that I was thinking about who I am, about what kind of a man I am, about what kind of a person I intend to be for the rest of my life and where I'm going. And something began to resonate with me that I had to make a shift and make a change at the age of 65. I had a, uh, a wonderful uh, office, uh, which was really a townhouse. It was filled with over 20,000 books. It was filled with clothing. It was filled uh, with uh, records of all kinds. It had uh, pictures on the wall. I had awards that I had received over the years and everything that I had accumulated literally in this physical world um, had accumulated in that office. I turned the key and handed it to my manager, Maya, who's been with me for almost 30 years, and I said, I would like you to sell everything or distribute everything that's in there. Sell the townhouse, get rid of it take all the records, all the books, I got rid of my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I um, <clears throat> left it all behind and turned it over to her to get, to get rid of everything. I detached myself from a lifetime of accumulations and I moved uh, full time to a place uh, over in the middle of the Pacific Ocean on one of our great islands called Maui. And in the next... Um, months, I began to get a lot of things coming to me about what my life was to, uh, what was to unfold, things that I wasn't even expecting. And I think about this idea about uh, what age you are and um, whether or not changes and shifts can be made and how difficult so many people uh, attribute this to. They say, it's just, that's an impossibility. I couldn't possibly do that. I'm so attached to all of these things. 
or I'm too old, uh, I've, been, I've been living in the same place too long, whatever it might be. Uh, right here in this audience is one of, the, uh, one of the women that I revere. I think more than, uh, more than any other woman I can think of in the professional world. Um, at the age of 60, she changed her thoughts and her life changed dramatically. She started a publishing company called Hay House, which is one of the world's largest publishers of spiritual and higher consciousness materials. She wrote a book called You Can Heal Your Life. She's here today. Her name is Louise Hay. Louise, would you stand up and be acknowledged? Thank you, sweetheart. Louise, uh, with a great number of people from all over the world, just celebrated her 80th birthday. So, I should look so good even at 60, all right? <laughs> and um, I'm just so deeply honored that you're here, dear. Thank you. Um, what happened for me in the next few months was, um, was absolutely life-changing. I had a friend tell me who was uh, severely addicted to uh, all kinds of drugs and alcohol, who was basically uh, very close to, uh, to death. He refused all kinds of treatment. He wouldn't go through the programs and so on. But he read a book, and the book was called The Tao Te Ching. The Tao Te Ching. T-A-O-T-E-C-H-I-N-G. Tao Te Ching. Tao in ancient Chinese means the way the great way. TE is the term that means the application of or the virtue of. And Qing, in ancient Chinese, means book. So it's the book for applying the virtue of living the way. That's what this book means. And he told me that, and I thought, I've heard of the Tao Te Ching. I've heard of Taoism. I've been, I'm familiar with that. I had read about it. Uh, when I was in college, I'd even lectured a little bit about it when I was teaching at a university in, in New York City, at St. John's University. Um, it was uh, something that I had sort of a, a cursory uh, awareness of, but it wasn't uh, something that I was really profoundly interested in. I was watching a TV show one night, and someone talked about the Tao on there. I walk into a uh, bookstore, and there's a copy of the Tao. This is all happening in the six months or so that uh, between uh, when I had left and knowing that it was time for me to detach myself from all of the things that had been so much a part of my life and move on into a new area of my life. So I, I couldn't resist it any longer. And I said, I'd really want to, I really want to... Re